Should I pull this in a little closer? I've noticed that you guys yeah. have this. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. fine. As is. Um, Jamie Brissick, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much, David. I'm honored to be here. It is, uh, you are a fan favorite episode, believe it or not. Wow. Um, huh. Yours, so your episode, I think it was one of the first episodes that I had done in Surf Splendor that um, expanded our awareness beyond just like our little local audience. I feel like for that got passed virally. I was getting notes from important people in the surf media, important famous pro surfers n sending me notes like, hey, dude, I listened to this episode. This was excellent. Wow. And it really, I think, expanded our audience. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, uh, I don't. I don't quite know why. Um, yeah. I do. I would imagine there's more interesting uh, guests that you can have. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not. I think what the reason was your candor. Uh-huh. So what I found in this, you can apply sure. in your new profession uh -huh. of podcasting, um, of hosting. What I found to be a good episode is somebody who's articulate and willing to share. Uh -huh. And so it doesn't necessarily matter if they're A-list or uh -huh. what their exact story is. Some people have super interesting stories, but they don't necessarily share them. Yeah, you know, And they're not articulate about it. And they're a little bit reserved. You know, I interviewed Mick Fanning at some point, uh -huh. 2018, let's say. Red Bull reaches out and they're like, hey, Mick Fanning's coming through town for f five hours between surf trips. And uh, so his PR team at Red Bull's like, hey, would you like to do an interview for your podcast? And I'm like, absolutely. I could not get Mick to share one candid detail. Uh -huh. He was so used to being interviewed. He's yeah. such a professional yeah. that he just kept giving me these kind of automatic responses sure. that I'd heard a million times before. And I published that episode and it, whatever, it was fine. But I'll interview a surfboard shaper that nobody's ever heard of, Yeah, but they're an they just know how to communicate their story. Yes. And that gets five times the engagement. No, that's really interesting. You know, I remember years ago reading the New York Times book review had um, had reviewed two or three memoirs by athletes um, in one review. And the and the writer whose name has escaped me opened up by saying that the best athletes memoirs are typically by the lower ranked athletes as opposed to the best because the best are always trying to sort of preserve their legacy. And I think um, maybe because my, my surfing career wasn't epic. And then the other thing is as a writer, I think in many ways writing can be like a self therapy where you dig into yourself. And when I was younger as a writer and maybe writing like personal essay type stuff, I was, I was, my ego was in there. It was sort of like, I got to make, I got to make sure I look good in this stuff. And then, Time and events in my life liberated me from all that, and uh, so I, I got, for better or for worse, I didn't. I stopped caring so much, Good. and so I just felt like I, I'm going to be myself, and I really, I, I'm, I'm a bumbling fool for the most part, and terribly insecure, and I'm just trying to get by in this life, and that, um, and that's the honest to God truth, and I'm not going to present myself otherwise, you know. Dang charming. Yeah. It is dang charming well, and appealing. Yeah. Actually, it's very contrived and I just, I work it. <laughs> I work it. <laughs> it's working for you. Um, so that was that episode because it helped expand our audience, but also because it was a moment where I realized that that candor was more important than other things that I thought were important. Uh -huh. um, was a big episode for me. Oh, so, cool. Well, yeah. thank you. So, yeah. Um, but you know the the thing is is I think if there's a, if the the theme or the thread among most of your guests is surfing and I think um, I don't know I love surfing and I love surfers but it's not necessarily like if it were a, if this were a podcast with artists or writers or people that are their their self expression is coming less through their physicality and more through their minds and hearts let's say you, that it might be more common of the, those that forthcomingness might be a more common thing among your guests. Agreed. Well, so that was another detail that I figured out, maybe not in our conversation, but it definitely happened in our conversation was I used to think that this conversation needed to be about surfing. Yeah. And so things would go off on a tangent that was actually meaningful and sentimental mm -hmm. and relatable. Uh -huh. And I would steer it back to surfing. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, but what about that contest in 1984? Yep. And then I realized over the course of years that no, 
Nobody gives a crap about that contest in 84. We want to hear from people we know from the surf world talking about life and uh -huh. loss and yep. marriage and that yep. sort of stuff. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. And so our conversation definitely went down those paths. And I think that's relatable Cool for everybody. Um, what affected me most about our conversation specifically was stories about Gisela, uh -huh. um, which you at the time had encapsulated for an article in the Surfer's Journal called The Dazzling Blackness. Yep. So I think you had processed it. We discussed it. It was the processing of your regret that stuck with me. Uh huh. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what the article was about. Yes, it and was. And you had made some mistakes in the relationship. Yep. And then, of course, um, she tragically passes. Yep. And so then you're stuck dealing with that regret yeah. and not being able to reconcile it. Uh, the question for you now is just where are you at? processing that loss yeah it's so interesting because um i might have even said this when we spoke last but you know it and it's it's a horrible thing to say but like the my wife's passing made me a better writer it was like the best thing that ever happened in my writing because as i was saying earlier i felt like it was almost like i needed to grow into a place and it's not even necessarily a admirable place it's not a place i recommend but there was a certain um being a widower and, 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 and suffering that loss, I just didn't care anymore. You know, it, I just sort of felt like I'm, I, I might be out of here soon anyway. You know, like I, f I had what sort of one foot in the world and one foot in whatever escape in my mind. And I don't mean that in a suicide threat kind of way, but I just meant like, I, I'm not, I, I'm, I've, I've kind of given up on the world. Like my life, I, I never imagined something as painful as this, but weirdly it liberated me. It like allowed me to be open and, and um, honest. And it was like, yeah, I, I was surprised and people responded to me and people responded to my writing in a way that they never had in the past. Um, so it, it actually, by writing about this painful stuff, I definitely became a writer, a better writer. And the thing that I'd wanted all along back when she was alive and I was young and bright eyed was I got it, but I got it not in the way I would have wanted it, I suppose. Um, but no, I've written a lot about pain and loss. And in, in a, and then, you know, I wrote that piece, The Dazzling Blackness, and I got a very positive response. And then <laughs> not too long after um, my home burned down, and I wrote a piece, a few pieces about that and got a great response. And in some ways, it was sort of leaning into these things that are really painful. Um, some of my best writing has been about that. That being said, and I did write about this in the Dazzling Blackness piece in the Surface Journal, I don't quite know whether it's a good thing to, to go into that stuff or not. I mean, as a writer, I guess it is, but I feel like I've suffered a kind of psychic toll as a result. Um, and I don't quite know whether I I sometimes feel like maybe I, I'm, I my identity is based on these tragic things. I mean, I was, I've, I was at a, like, art thing last night and I was talking to someone and I, I found myself about to say I'm a widower and I was like, no, just stop that. Stop. Don't do that anymore. It's don't. Um, and yet it's real and it's true. So I, I'm, I'm like still, um, I'm still trying to figure that one out. And I, I made the joke earlier that, that like, this is like this, this like thing I employ to like earn attention or sympathy. And I don't, I might, I, I truly don't know. I started writing about this stuff thinking like, the writers I admire most and their most meaningful work has often been this. Maybe they do it fictionally. I did it in sort of personal essay form. Um, but yeah, it's you, you dig into those things and you can maybe get stuck there or maybe, maybe be there more than you want to be. Um, and it seems so normal to me because most of my, I'm, most of my friends are artists and writers. And so that kind of like, that's the, that's the like um, subject matter often or going into those places uh, and when I hang out with surfers who who are live in the sunshine, literally and figuratively, I'm often like, "Oh, I forgot. I, for I used I used to be like that, you know." So where am I at with it? I'm just trying to process all of it. Still <laughs> doing the best I can. It, I mean, it's interesting. It's so fascinating to hear you talk about it. Uh -huh. So many di things bubble up that are relatable in that. Um, it seems like. Like if you can, so writing about it, you feel so viscerally about it that it's easy to write about it. Mm -hmm. um, it. You want it, you never want to 
remove, divorce yourself from those emotions because it's almost, it would be callous to do that. And you uh -huh. don't want to be a callous person. Yep. It's part of the tapestry. Yeah. And so you don't want to pull that thread out. You want it, but you also don't want to write exclusively about it. Like if you can exactly. kind of leverage what you learned about writing from that, but live in the sunshine and yeah. write about the sh sunshine still, yes. that would be the ideal scenario to be in. Yeah, for sure. And I think the other side of it is if I were not a professional writer. I, it might be what what might be called journaling, right? Like a therapist might go, okay, your, your wife has passed away. You, you should like get a, a, a spiral notebook and write in it every morning yeah, and yeah. journal and process this stuff and see the words on the page back at you and kind of do that weird, um, there's almost like a, a self cross-examination that goes on when you write. Because I write professionally and because I actually need to get my work out there, get my work published and get it out there just to sort of keep my thing going. Um, by doing that and by having readers and 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 a, a, a small public know it and then associate that and almost project that back at you, that's the thing I'm getting at where uh, you can almost get, like I, I wonder if I'm playing this victim game, you know, with I'm like happy in the victim role. And I, yeah. I don't, I, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Yeah. It's but I definitely have learned a lot by writing into things that are painful. Um, so what, how old were you when she passed away? I was 46. And you're 55 now. Yep. So nine years. Um, the question that was in my notes, you and I kind of covered some of it off air right now, but the question that was in my notes is what is dating like in your fifties? Hmm. Wow. Well, I was in a really beautiful relationship recently. Um, and, um, I'm trying to figure that one out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you use dating apps? Where do you meet no. people in your 50s? No, I've never done dating apps. And I, I think they seem, they, they, they might be good. Um, I'm not sure if that's the direction I want to go <laughs> right now. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, the, it's, it would be impossible to not carry what we were just talking about into a relationship, mm -hmm. but I think it would inform, it would make you a better partner in a lot of ways. Well, you know, this is the, okay. So well, well, let's, the, let's keep the honesty theme going. That's, that's, a, that's a tricky thing. It would um, be hard for the partner yeah. to fully understand yeah. what you're going through or um, why you still talk about your ex-wife or whatever yes. it is. Not yes. ex-wife, by the way. But yeah. yeah. Late wife, yeah. Yeah, late wife. So it would be a very it would take a very mature partner to understand what you're going through and accept you as you are. Yes. But it does make you a better partner. No, I I, I fully agree. And I have I've been in two relationships since my wife passed away and it and and her um I think to some extent she's loomed as a, maybe a ghost that can be threatening to the person I'm with. Um, and I've never intended that. I've never wanted it to be that. But again, this is uh, by writing about it. I'm, I'm, I'm like almost, you know, confirming it in some weird way or, or, or setting it down in published form to where it, it lives for perpetuity. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I definitely think absolutely like that has made me, you know, deeper I, and like less going for the, um, the superficial sh stuff, um, much more inclined to like go deep into a relationship. Right. And I, uh, there was a, another version of me in my late twenties where, you know, casual relationships, one nighters or whatever were like more, more in my reality. Whereas yeah. now as I'm, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to do that. You want, Meaning. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, so the ghost that looms in your past is there. There's no denying it. And yep. so you're the right partner will understand it for what it is and appreciate you for being able to go deep as a result of it and all that sort of yep. stuff. Yeah. 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 So, yep. Um, you, I, by the way, I was Googling your name. Not that I, just to see what Google said. It has you listed as an actor. Hmm. It says Jamie Brissick, actor. Really? Yeah. Well, I'm acting right now, David. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What is that about? Or what are they referencing? Um, I'd, I'd, 
It could quite quite possibly be from a movie called Back to the Beach, and I did a stunt doubling thing. Okay. Yeah, Herbie Fletcher was in it as well. You, I feel like your writing would um, be the first thing that would be listed. Yeah, your writing would, is more I, substantial than that one. I'd role. much prefer that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what was Back to the Beach? It was a movie, it was a Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello remake in 1986 or 7. Oh my gosh. Herbie Fletcher was in it. Um, there were a bunch of, it was, there were these surf scenes and we, there, was, there were a bunch of water scenes. I actually got to go to Hawaii and, um, and get a wave that was in the film. Wait, at where? Third dip of all places. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Did you surf it well? I think I did okay. I, um, there was a guy named Yuri Ferrant who was the cinematographer. And we, so we were originally trying to get the footage at Zuma Beach where most of the film was shot. And the waves never quite cooperated or the weather didn't. And I think it needed to be like a blue sky type of shot and a decent wave. And so I kind of strategically presented to the producer that um, if we go to Hawaii, we can nail this thing. And he's like, he laughed at me. He's like, I know, we, I know what you're trying to do, but we can, if that's going to get it, we can. So I went to Hawaii for like a couple of days on a swell, connected with Yuri, paddled out at third dip on this board that had been painted a brick, like it had this brick kind of um, air spray to match the character, the, the actor who was not a surfer. So I was stunt doubling. Yeah. And I paddled out at third dip. Yuri was on the beach. I was alone. And there were two or three surfers in the water. One of them was Perry Dane. And um, Perry got a wave, got barreled, came past me, paddled back around, and I'm sitting there just like sitting on my board trying to look as like friendly as possible. And he just paddles right up to me and with this big hand and arm, he's like, go in already. And I just turned. And once he saw me complying with what he, his demand, he's like, okay, you can surf. Oh, wow. And I ended up having a fun ses session with him. And at the time I was sponsored by Quicksilver and he knew a lot of those people. So it was like, we were talking about all the boys and then it all turned nicely. And I got, and I had a small short wave uh, in the film and that was my, wow. my thing. Yeah. Uh, it was a test. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Good for you. Yeah. For complying. Yeah. Especially with the production on the line and everything else. Yes. You easily could have yep. tried to fight it. Um, well, the next time that I Google you, I expect for that actor to be removed and podcaster I, to, to replace it. Yeah, I hope so. Welcome to the podcasting world. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is highly anticipated. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to do it. And it's, um, it's new and um, really fun. Is it? I mean, I feel like, well, I would imagine you, you're far more seasoned than me, but these are fun conversations to have. Dude, I'm so grateful. Yeah. To, to have been able to have them. Yep. Um, absolutely fun. Absolutely like, uh, well, let me back up. Soundings is what your podcast is called. Yes. It's being produced by the Surfers Journal. Yes. I think you are a perfect fit for the job. Thanks. Firstly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so how did this opportunity come about? Let's start there. So <clears throat> I started, the first piece I did for the Surfers Journal, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it was 1992. I was living in Sydney, Australia at the time. I was getting a surfboard shaped by Wayne Lynch. And Wayne lived in Victoria. I lived in Sydney. And he came up to Sydney. And he ended up staying at my house, which was incredible because he was such a hero. And he was so mythical to me. And while he was there, we really, we surfed together. We talked a lot. It was this incredible thing where like him shaping me aboard became like almost like there was a friendship and it was almost, it was almost this thing of like, let's not only go surfing together, but let's talk about life and then I'll go shape the board accordingly. Wow. And so while that was happening and I was new to journalism, I just, my pro surfing career had ended uh, about a year before and I'd been working at waves and tracks magazines, which shared the same building in Sydney in the, in the city in rush cutters Bay, which is near King's cross right in the heart of the city. So I was going to work every day and I was kind of learning what it meant to be an editor and a journalist um, and hang out with a lot of really interesting people. And the Surfers Journal had just come out and I sent a pitch letter or I, I don't know the words, there was no emailing back then. I, maybe I called, but I said, um, I'm spending some time with Wayne Lynch. Would you be interested in a piece? And Steve Pesman at the time was not only the publisher, but the editor as well. And he said, yes, great. So I like probably, 
I think I maybe already had a little recording device, but I sat with Wayne and we talked and talked and talked and I was so new to it that like everything he said was utterly sacred. And I probably had, you know, 10,000 words of, of Wayne talking, edited that, edited that into a piece. And it was in um, what I believe is like the first four or six issues of the Surfers Journal. So I've been doing pieces for the journal for all that time. And I think in a weird way, um, I've like, it's almost been reciprocal where the journal has shaped me. Mm. Um, and to some extent contributing pieces, I've like, I've, I've understood the aesthetic and, and the ethos and the, all, you know, there's a, there's a very specific sort of um, quality and a level of class. I mean, I feel like I've learned so much as a contributor to the Surface Journal. So all these years later to do a podcast, it's, I kind of understand what that means and what the way in which to approach that. It's not exploitative. It's not, you know, everything is the, hopefully like everyone that ever, we ever talked to or I ever talked to is going to feel like it was a good conversation. I wasn't trying to poke them or do the gotcha kind of thing at all. Um, so yeah, so we'd been talking about it for a while and then it, it came to fruition. We, we went through um, prospective guests. We whittled it down to the eight people who are in episode one and, um, and off we go. Season one. Season one, sorry. Yeah, it's uh, so you are a great fit for the job for Thanks. that reason. Thanks. Your backstory that you just gave and also um, your communication style, I think, is a great fit for the medium. Why did it appeal to you to do it? You know, I, in many ways, and I and I actually, I should thank you because, and I've done a few podcasts, but you were one of the first ones I ever did. And, and it was a new medium, as we talked about earlier. Um it's sort of like what I've been doing anyway, but it's just doing it kind of almost a live version of it. Um, I've been interviewing people since that Wayne Lynch. I mean, before, I think I did a couple pieces before that. So I've been doing whatever that is, 30 years of journalism, often with a little recording device, sitting down with people, asking them a lot of questions, like going into that journalism mode where you can sort of ask questions that would be strange. Otherwise, if you were sitting having lunch with someone, it would almost feel invasive. But you, as a journalist, like, okay, I got to get, we got to just cut to the chase here. Why this, this, and this? So having done that for a long time, having for many, many years transcribing those re recordings, those interviews myself, now I have like a place where I get it done and sent back. But going through transcriptions, often asking way more questions than I need, getting, you know, way more words than I need, and then editing that down. There's almost like, um, we talked about it earlier. It's it's almost like I imagine if you were if 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 I were in a in a if you were a musician and you were working on a song and you would you would sit in your studio like refining the song and getting it right and and hitting a certain perfection to it. Um, that to my mind is how like the the a Q and A or a profile might live on the page or on the webs on the, the home page of a of a newspaper or whatever. Um, the podcast is almost the live playing of the show. It's sort of like whatever goes down in this conversation is is what it's going to be, and it's it's extemporaneous. It's live. It's there's no rehearsing. There's whereas when I do it on the page, I edit, I massage, I move things around. Sometimes as the interviewer, I'll change my, I'll ask a question in a very stuttered, lame way, and I'll go back and make myself sound a little better. I confess that I do do that. Yeah. Um, but like the the podcast format I think is really cool because there is something really conversational, really relaxed. There's some, like an instant gratification to it. That's different to the longer process of editing or writing a profile. Yeah. But I'm, but, but the theme it continues, which is I'm really interested in a lot of these people and I want to get into the heart of yeah. what they, what makes them tick. And so it doesn't like, it feels really, really natural. It's just that it's happening right now with a micro with, you know, live versus I, go home and clean it up and move it around and cut and paste. And you have a uh, rapport with a lot of the people that you're interviewing, like you're already established as friends. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that goes a long way too. Yeah, it does. And, and I think, um, and that's one of the reasons why it does feel really natural because a lot of the, I mean, so far, like the, it's all to, to the point where it's like everyone I pretty much know and have a shared history with to yeah. some extent. Yeah. Um, and talking to like Tony Alva, who's one of the, season one, eight people. I mean, I, I think at one point I, I recalled like I was 12 years old and we were skateboarding at Kenter and I saw you doing this. And I remember being at the Marina Del Rey skate park when you were doing these magical things in the dog bowl and, and blah, 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 blah. So there's, um, it's kind of nice to do that. It's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of, of, um, 
I don't know. It's almost like my dad died a couple of years ago and towards the end of his life, I actually started recording some conversations with him. Yeah. And it was sort of this thing of like, oh, I've known this person for a long time. And now for posterity, let's get into the heart of the matter, so to speak. Like, let's like get into some of your ideas about life. And with these podcasts, given that I have shared history with a lot of the subjects or guests, um, it's almost like, okay, I've been seeing you surfing for 25 years. Um, now I'm going to like slightly interrogate you as to what you really feel about these things, you know? Did you actually interview your dad? Yes. Good for you. Yeah. Holy yep. cow. Yeah. How did you feel about it? Did you get some amazing things out of it? My dad was a writer and so it was perfectly normal for him. So he completely related. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it was cool. But my dad wrote, wrote prolifically and wrote a lot of stuff for me and my family. And so it's, I, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing where like this stuff, this, there's not other, um, you know, proof of his existence or his ideas. There's, I have a, yeah. I have endless amounts of getting into my father now since he's <laughs> departed. Um, in hindsight, is there anything that you wish you would have asked him that you didn't? Mm. No, it's interesting because my father was was the was the the slow or the long goodbye, if you will. Whereas my wife's passing was the uh, poof and they're gone. And my brother, who died when I was younger, was a poof and you're gone. And um, so when my dad died, he was eighty six, and it was um, it didn't feel you know he a he lived a long life, and b there were signs that he was go- on his way out about a year in advance. So uh, there was nothing unsaid. So I got to, you know, hang out with him. Good. I mean, there were times when it was almost like, oh, I'm hanging out with you because I know you're going to go, but there's nothing left to say because we've already said it. And when he finally passed away, it, there was definitely, there was not, none of that thing that I definitely felt with my wife and I definitely felt with my brother, which is, oh my God, we didn't, you're gone and I didn't get to put those things right, you know? Yeah. Um, a friend of mine promoted this idea a few years back about interviewing your dad. Uh-huh. He was like, this is something that everybody should do, especially if they're still fully cognizant and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Yep. And then a couple of my friends took his advice and did it. And they all told me I need to do it. And so I asked my dad if he was down to do it. And he said, absolutely. And that was a year and a half ago or two years ago. And I just haven't done it yet. Uh-huh. Um, but I a hundred percent intend to and yep. plan to. And yeah, I'm, I've got a note on my notes app, I have a list of questions uh-huh. that I kind of add to, and which is why I asked you yeah. if there was anything you wish you would have said, because I would add that to my list of questions. Right. But my dad and I have a great relationship. We always have, so it's very comfortable, but I've never asked him specific things, uh-huh. you know, mm-hmm. um, that are part of my conversation with my friends mm-hmm. on a daily basis, you know, about dating, you know, like dating your relationships or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff that you and I are talking about, I don't address with my dad. Yeah. Because he's not a peer. Yeah. But I'd be curious to know what dating was like for him in his 30s or whatever, you yep. know? Yep. So. No, it's fascinating stuff. One of the questions I asked my father, my father liked a little sip in the at the end of the day. And, um, and it put him in a really nice place. And there were times when it was, you know, I was concerned and I've always been very conscious. I have a brother who died of a drug overdose. So I've been very, always maybe too hard on myself with, with any kind of substances. And I remember saying, um, you know, dad, having, um, having enjoyed your, your cocktail every evening, um, do you ever think like, you know, that was habitual, like you were just, it was kind of, it got you more than you got it. Or I'm, I'm kind of blowing my punchline. Do you ever feel like you were doing it too much? And he said, I'll quote Winston Churchill, I took more out of drinking than drinking took out of me. So for him, it was, there was no, there was no regret. There was no like, oh yeah, I, I wish I wasn't on that cycle because I think with alcohol for sure there's that habitual thing where you just if you drink two months in a, every evening for two months that 61st day is a very difficult one not to have that drink you know right um, and my dad would had done that for most of his life he enjoyed his drink in the evening and it was and he there was no apologies at all fair enough yeah and good for him for understanding that because um for some people it becomes a problem for others it don't and for the people that it doesn't become a problem for, it's hard for other people to understand that, yeah. that it's not a problem. Yep, for sure. The way I've heard, so I actually had this conversation with Thad uh-huh. Zilkowski. Oh yeah, one of your such, such a great dude. He's one of your guests in season one. Mm-hmm. But the conversation I had with him was um, the best definition that I've heard for addiction is um, doing, you're doing this, the thing despite the consequence. Mm-hmm. 
So it can't be defined by volume. Yeah. Because some people can drink a six pack of beer and never get drunk. Yeah. Other people uh, nightly. Yep. Other people drink a six pack of beer and they beat their wife and they yeah. don't wake up in the morning. Yes. You know? And they yep. miss their job and they get fired. Yeah. So it can't be defined by volume. But if you are uh, getting fired from your job because of whatever the volume is and you continue drinking, that's addiction. Yeah. Right. So drinking despite the consequence. Yep. Yep. There's a great quote um, that goes, um, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection, okay. which, which is like a lot of addicts. And I, and Thad gets into this, I think, to some extent in his book, which is like a lot of um, addiction is a, is, a, is a result of what, what uh, the Buddhists will call separateness, this feeling of like everyone over there is okay, but I'm over here and I'm this fucked up person. Um, but I think that is sort of an interesting one. Yeah, it is. Did you like Thad's book? Loved it. I yeah. thought it was so great. I mean, and it's so interesting because... It gets into a lot of neuroscience. It gets into addiction very deeply, but it also has like all the great stories of surfing are in there too. Totally. And um, and I felt like I got to know these surfers who who have been heroes, who have been people I've sort of grown up with in, via the magazines and some in some instances like Tom Carroll, Peter Mel, etc. Like uh, these are peers and contemporaries. Um, just getting into their stories, it was fascinating. Yeah, it was. A lot of those stories, I actually didn't know some of the details that he was sharing. Yep. But the way that he wrote about the um, physiology or neurology or whatever kind of part of it, I felt like he had professional training yeah. or education yeah. in those things. Turns out he doesn't. No, I know. He's an incredibly good writer. I mean, he's such a great writer. And But what I liked most about this, uh, the book itself was – him being really kind of actualized about his experience, his addiction, yeah, how it's affected his life, and almost being able to write from it from a place, uh, from like a third party place almost. I agree. You know, yeah. like yeah. him just being able to look and be like, it affected me in this way. Yeah. Here, and it was very actualized. Yeah, I thought so too. And it kind of wove um, journalism or nonfiction with uh with a memoir, with his own story. Totally. And there, that was there. So you really get a sense of who, who your narrator is. Um, and you know that he, you, you, you learn that he is so qualified to be writing this book because he's been through it himself. Completely. Yep. Yep. So guest list, who are among the guests on season one of the sounding or just sounding? Stephanie Gilmore, Tony Alva, Thad Zilkowski, Emmy Erickson, Mike D, Dave Parminer, Dane Reynolds, Laird Hamilton. It's an incredible guest list. Thanks. Yeah. Diverse. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. I was, I was trying to think of it. Um, there, there are like, there are different flavors of each person or, or different sort of specializations with well, let's call it like, um, and I wanted to make sure that there was, that they rounded each other out, yeah. that it didn't feel like you were serving up a, a you know, fish and meat and chicken all in the same plate. Um, it's sort of like, well, let's get some chicken and let's get some greens and let's get some starch and let's get an appetizer. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go off menu. Yeah. Uh, who's Emmy Erickson and why? Emmy her? Erickson is a, is she lives on the North shore. She rides big waves. She rides primarily single fins. She had a heavy duty wipeout in one of the jaws events a while back. And she's the daughter of Roger Erickson, who when I was a pro surfer, Roger was, one of the top surfers at YMA. So I thought I was really fascinated by the fact that she's second generation and a girl, which is definitely like an, an anomaly in the big wave realm, I guess, or the minority, um, and rides the single fins as well. And it's like, there's this sort of paying homage to her father by in fact, riding her, some of her dad's older boards in giant YMA, etc. Lyle Carson surfboards. Is that who she's riding? Lyle Carson. Lyle. I'm not sure who the shaper oh, okay. is actually. Um, but Roger Erickson was was uh, was in the generation of like Brock Little, Mark yeah, yeah. Fu, Ken Bradshaw, Derek Dorner, etc. Amazing. Yep. Um, what'd you learn about Laird Hamilton? Laird was fantastic, and I did you um, have a pre-existing relationship? No, not really. To oh, be okay. honest, I, I've no. I obviously none of Laird forever. I mean, the, the interesting thing with Laird is I've always felt that Laird's lived sort of outside of the surf world. And I've, I, I over the years there have been times when I've tried to do pieces with him, and he's and he hasn't made himself available for whatever reason. Um, so I think he's he's sort of um, he's structured his career or or handled his career in a, in a totally different way. It's interesting because I never you'd never think this. 
But talking with Lair and talking with Dane Reynolds, there's actually a connection, and you would not see that on the surface. But both of them have sort of created their careers outside of the traditional route of like whatever, competing, um, you know, using the, the, going for the traditional sponsors and, and using the traditional channels to promote themselves. Um, and I was happy to get them both because both, I think, can be sort of elusive. Um, and I think the Surfer's Journal was a great thing because they both respect the publication. But um, what I got from Laird, it, what was interesting is in some way, you know, like seared into my memory or, or my brain is um, the millennium, millennial wave, millennium wave at Chopu. And then a lot of the Jaws stuff, which weirdly like happened a while ago now. And Laird is at a later stage of his life. Um, and so, and I'm 55. So in many ways, like, when I'm talking to someone like that, in many ways, I go in a very earnest way going, how, how do you, what is a surfing life at this stage? You know, what, what is the most valued way or what is the best way to do that and make it meaningful? Because I certainly know firsthand there's a level of like being attached to the performance side and maybe the ego side where when I go, when I go out and I'm hoping to tear it up and be like a alpha in the lineup, that's that doesn't so much work anymore. Um, so there's the fitness stuff. There's the equipment stuff. There's the do you go to the mainstream? You know, do you hang in the like popular breaks or do you find your own private breaks? Laird had said something about um, we were talking about you know Jaws and sort of pioneering um, surf breaks, and he was saying, and I asked him if he's still looking for like the next Jaws or what have you, and he said. Um, he said something to the effect of, um, I am, but you'll never know about it because I'm not going to share it, you know? So He's there was made that mistake more than once. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, but it, there was, I definitely had the sense of like, this is a, this is a, um, later in his career Laird that I'm talking to, as opposed to the Laird that might be more alpha dog, I guess. Um, do you like him or did you like him? Yeah. I thought he was great and he was very generous. Um, I mean, he gave a lot to the conversation. There wasn't, he wasn't looking at his watch. I, I had no idea what to expect, quite honestly. And I, um, he seemed, I think like I, as we spoke, the, we, I, my bona fides kind of came out and he realized I know, I, I mean, I remember seeing Laird, you know, I think he was wearing like straps on his feet and trying to do like air 360s in the 80s at, off the wall, um, maybe wearing sun deck shorts. And then there was like the, um, the period where he was spending a lot of time in uh, France and he was, um, he had a sponsor from there. Oxbow. Yeah, Oxbow, exactly. So, so there was, so I think without me actually doing research or homework, he knew that I knew and uh, that like maybe made him respect me and not feel like I'm just some idiot asking dumb questions. I would hope that he knew who you were. I think so. Did he? Yeah, I think so. Okay, good. Yep. <laughs> Laird should. Yeah. But he exists, like you said, outside of everything that maybe he just has his head down and he doesn't care. Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, he's a fascinating figure to me and I feel like I would like him as well. Yeah. I've never made an effort to reach out. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, but I just, I do admire the things that you just said, the things that you talked are identified, which is he certainly has created a career uh -huh. outside of the surf industry, but he'd be doing what he's doing without a career. Yeah. He'd be working construction to make sure that he could do what he's continuing to do. Like it, the career thing is irrelevant. He was smart enough to figure out, I should probably make a career out of it so I could do it more frequently, yep. but he's just going to do what he's going to do, period. No, you're, you're, you're so right on. And in fact, one of the things I asked him was, um, when people ask what you do for a living, what do you say? Because I've often thought like Laird's almost like a living Superman. Like it's, he's That's like out of a Marvel yeah. comics um, film or something yeah. like that. And what I got from him, what's so interesting, because when you think of Laird and I think, wasn't he in like an American Express commercial at one point? I mean, yep. he's done so much stuff that's been sort of really glamorous and in, in the mainstream. And he's such a recognizable name. And we know that he has a lot of famous friends. There was like a real, I could see the kind of like, well, as you say, like the blue collar Hawaii guy, you know, Hawaii boy, where he, um, he talked about earlier on in, in his career, he would do whatever he had to, to make things, um, to make it happen. So, you know, to earn money. So I think he did probably do construction. I think he talked about maybe doing gardening, but he was doing like things just to get by. Right. Yeah, yeah. And he still seems like he, that's that, that boy is still inside of him. And he said that sometimes when, um, 
people ask what he does for a living. He says he, he says he used to say he was a garbage man. That's interesting. Yeah. It's a lot easier because then nobody asks follow-up questions. Yeah. Yes. And I, but, but I, but my vibe from him was he wasn't doing it in an arrogant way. No, he was doing no. it more in a kind of playful way in a self-deprecating way. Yeah. There was, he was far more self-deprecating and human than okay. I expected. And I, I'm, I'm used to this like hulking Adonis character, this right. like Greek God. And I was, I was in, almost intimidated by that. Yeah, yeah. And as I sat with him more and more, he just became just, just, he's just another guy trying to make it happen. I mean, that's the interesting thing I think about a lot of the people who make for the interesting conversations are say over 40, 45, whatever they're in a stage of life where, um, you know, and you were talking about McFanning earlier. When you often talking to the athletes in the height of their careers, they don't have the perspective to really talk about it. What they're doing it. So what they have to offer most of all is is standing on the board and tearing the crap out of waves. Yeah. And that's what that's like what they're gonna do best. And if they give us the sort of canned response when we try to talk to them, well, of course, because they're not, they're, it's not like they wanna go into the weeds of the conversation. That's not, conversation is not necessarily their like mode of communication. Their mode of communication expression is on a surfboard. Whereas someone later in life that the, the like their, their phys physicality, their physical fitness is maybe, maybe diminished a little bit. They've had to face that. They've probably experienced some loss because if you live four or five decades on this earth, inevitably you will. And so they become more real. And I think that the Laird, to bring it back to Laird, like he, he was just, he was, he's just another guy getting by in the world, you know? Good. Yeah. I like that. I yeah. like him more. Yeah. Um, did you like Dane Reynolds? Dane was fantastic. Mm. And Dane was, um, again, like a different set of things. I was worried about being... Um, just a little evasive, you know, like not, um, I don't know. I think I get the sense that Dane's like very, very smart and, and there's a certain skepticism, maybe cynical in some ways, or just suspicious of the kind of machinery. Um, and like the chapter 11 movie kind of depicts that. Like, I think in many ways he's such a talented guy and he's a sensitive guy and his like fantastic talent and the and and his sponsor's way of bringing that out to the world has almost made him like pull back. I mean, he talked about a nervous breakdown that he effectively had, or some some like he he fell apart when the pressure was on so much. So I think he's like a real artist in that way, and and he sort of figured out a way to make it his own. Where there's enough to where we get to see Dane, we can go to his uh, website and we can, or we can go online and YouTube and we can, and he makes his films, we can go see him and he's available to us and we love to watch him, but he's like preserving himself. He's not, it's, he's, he's, he's just maybe not cut out to be um, like a pop star, a bubblegum pop star in the surf world. And so I had no idea, you know, I've had conversations with him. I knew him before this, but I was just wondering kind of how much he was going to offer up and how much he might be like guarded and, and playing his cards close to his chest. But he, he was forthcoming. That's excellent. I mean, the fact that he even engaged in the interview indicates that he's willing to be somewhat uh, involved yeah, I was in, ready. in the machinery. I was totally ready for the cold shoulder and yeah. maybe not even getting back to me when I wrote him a note. And I would expect that you've given him, uh, he's had enough time off mm -hmm. that he's mm -hmm. willing to for the right person, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, and he, and he too, if you will, if, excuse me, but like much like Laird, I was surprised of a Dane that's, um, that's older, old, you know, getting older and maturing and reflective in some weird way. Yeah. Like a sense of like, he, there were, I saw a vulnerability in him he, and he talked about editing his own clips and being really critical and sometimes like not seeing himself tearing it up enough to use in a clip, which is interesting because yeah. we all love him so much. But there's this, there, I think I got a sense of like, I don't know, being aware of one's relevance and how long does that last? Yeah. He's an interesting case study and I, I admire the way that he managed his career and I understand also that he why he would have that nervous breakdown, the kind of level of scrutiny and fame that Kelly Slater lives with uh -huh. is totally unnatural. Yeah. Him being able to do it for his, uh, like engage with it head on as long as he has completely comes at the cost of personal relationships yeah. and all this other stuff. Whereas Dane, it's like, he's been with Courtney since high school. Mm -hmm. He's obviously committed to that and having kids and being a good dad. Yeah. What could be more healthy? Yeah. Like that is healthy and normal. Yeah, for and sure. And so this limelight kind of 
wedging itself in between will only create chaos and pandemonium for that family unit. Yeah. But the fact that he made millions of dollars off of Quicksilver for a period of time yep. is an unbelievable gift. So be able to, to be able to take that in, yeah. use it for what it's worth at that time, exit stage left and leverage that earning for the rest of your life and yeah. being able to live with your family. You're still young. Yep. It's not like he's 60 and decrepit. It's yeah. like he's still young being is incredible. No, he's played it so smart. I don't even think what you say is so smart. Right on. And I think it's like, we don't even, it's still too early. To, we It's it's still early on, but I think like 10 years from now, we'll look at it and go, this guy did it so right, you know? So right. He, he, he there was like a, a window of time when he was peaking and we were so interested in him. And I don't think it was a conscious thing. And in fact, we talk about this in the podcast, but like he did that classic thing. There's a, um, I recently came across this. It's called the Streisand effect. And Barbara Streisand has a home oh, in yeah. Malibu. And she didn't want the Coastal Commission to have it like somehow listed or the photograph of it. And by making an effort towards her own privacy and anonymity, she only created more attention to herself. And I think Dane has almost unwittingly done the Streisand effect where it's sort of like he doesn't want the attention. We will, Our appetite for Dane Reynolds is even bigger. Totally. Um, and... You know, and that was a certain period of time. It may, and it's maybe still exists today, but maybe not like it did 10 years ago or five years ago, whatever. But during that time, whatever he did worked so well. And we are so fascinated by this guy. And he cre and then he expressed himself through his movies. And there was like you know, the sort of autobiographical memoir stuff that he was able to express. And as you say, like to earn a bunch of money from it and then go, I'm go, I'm going to, live happily ever after with my family and I probably won't have to work a job I don't want to do because um, I'm set and I get to play with my kids all day and be with my wife and surf where I want. Great. And we're all still paying attention. So in 10 years from now, if he wanted to have a second coming of his career or yeah. third or whatever, we're all right here waiting for it. Yeah. You know, yep. with bated breath. No, it's true. And it's funny because I think um, the other thing is he's such an interesting guy beyond just the, I mean, I love the surfing, but just the way he's, um, he lives his life and the way his brain works. He's just super interesting to me. That's awesome. Yeah. Eager to hear that one. Yeah. Um, does Mike D shred? Mike D surfs pretty well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's uh, so sure, many, I wouldn't call I wouldn't say shred. Okay, there's so many um you know celebrities who do you see photos of Matthew McConaughey or Jeffrey Wright or Edward Norton standing on a wave. Yep. It's like cool they're getting into surfing. Yep. But it, who among them actually like knows what's up or knows what they're doing? No, for sure. Or does Mike D land? No, Mike D is definitely a proficient surfer. I mean, he's he's been doing it for a long time and he's he, he definitely can surf. Okay, cool. He's not on the podcast because he rips. That's definitely, and he would be the first person to say that. Right, right, But, right. and I think this is, but he's a, he's a bona fide surfer. Like, he loves it, and he's chased waves around the world, so that is all there. But the questions, the thing that I was curious about in the podcast was um, mostly, well, like, no, surfing did fit into. I mean, kind of finding surfing later in life, having done the Beastie Boys, and we're talking about how like how smart um, Dane has lived his life or sort of played his life. Mike D as well, really. You know, to be to be a Beastie Boy, to do all that great music, and then and then to raise a family and to be there with his kids, both of whom surf, and I surf with them all the time. Great, great kids. Um, like Mike, Mike, Mike still does plenty professionally, but my. I get the sense that most of all, he just loves his children and he's really into being a dad. Amazing. Yeah. That's great. And we got to talk about Beastie Boy stuff, which was really cool. And that level of fame and the um, taking of the state to the stage at major festivals with all those people and the coming down from that, which is always interesting to me. Um, so yeah, he was really fun to talk to. Uh, there's a bagel shop. I think it is in New York. They might have an LA location. It's called Yeasty Boys. Oh yeah, I've seen that. There's yeah. one in the valley, I think. It is, yeah. okay. North yeah, Hollywood. I thought yeah. they had one there. Yep. I, was, I think that's an amazing name for mm -hmm. a bagel shop. Um, mm -hmm. And their bagels look amazing. Follow them on Instagram. Yep. Um, they always say, you know, to never meet your heroes. Yep. They'll disappoint you. How's Tony Alva? Spectacular. Really? Tony was so inspiring. And Tony, I didn't know either. And I think Tony would be the first to admit that um, there was a time in his life where his ego was outsized and, 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 um, you know, too big for his own good. 
but Tony is in a really interesting place in his life. And I've known him for a while and we've been um, like LA contemporaries. Um, I knew him at, at like, you know, schoolyards and skate parks when I was young, when I was, when I was like hovering in the shadows as a little kid and he was a superstar. And then I've known him on the beach at Malibu where I, at one point I was like a good surfer and respected. Um, but so we have like a shared history and a lot of shared friends, but he was absolutely great. So inspiring. Cool. Yeah. I felt like, um, how to say like, for lack of a better description, I feel like he's an artist. And I, I think like being at his age in his sixties and still skateboarding, it was that thing that my, like that question I always have is like, how to, how does, how do you live? How, what does the good surfing life look like when you're over 50 years old or 45 years old? Tony, as a skateboarder, you can, you can just like pull it from skateboarding, bring it over to surfing and learn a lot. Yeah. And there's just a real like grace and beauty to him, just the way he carries himself and, and the way he takes care of himself. He's really into meditation. He's sober, um, very reflective and very um, much about like sharing the culture. Mm. Yeah. Um, what do we not know about Stephanie Gilmore that we ought to know? Great question. Um, well, the thing... I got into this in our podcast is I see like a um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of thing with her because we surf together in Malibu a lot and she's smiley faced, often riding a fish, giving away waves, chatting in the lineup. And if you didn't see what she does on an actual wave, you'd be like, oh, she's just a really friendly person in the lineup. And yet, as we all know, she's fiercely competitive, right? I mean, she's a seven-time world champion. You, you sort of, and granted, she's incredibly gifted, but I don't think you you get there like with Kelly Slater. You don't get there without like having that competitive fire. So I think um, I was curious as to like managing those two things because, for instance, with Kelly, Kelly is like famously competitive, right? You they talk about like if you go golfing with him, you'll see how competitive he is. If you play cards with him or checkers or chess or whatever, you're going to see like there's not a moment where this guy is not totally competitive. Whereas with Stephanie, she has this incredibly relaxed way about her. Um, and I was in Hawaii recently, and she and Laura Enever had rented a beachfront house at Pipeline. And I was going over there in the afternoons because it was one of those backyards that's like the front row seat in the pipe and the waves happened to be pumping the whole time. The back, yard, the back door shootout was on. Um, and I went, the one thing that I saw that was really interesting is so incredibly generous and gracious. Like anyone that came over, it was like, would you like a cup of coffee? Can I get you this? Can I get you that? Um, and then I also noticed how she would always be sort of taking care of the house. And it just, I, I, I don't know. I think like that, that greatness and when I say greatness, I'm not using that term loosely, but like winning multiple world titles and and sustaining a career for that long, there's a thing of, um, I don't know, just operating at this really high level. I've seen that in her. I've seen that. And I think it's there you do, you just hit the, um, you don't get caught up in the, in the, in the low shit, if you know what I'm saying. Like you're just, you're, you're, you're operating at a higher frequency. Mm. I'm in love with her. Yeah. I totally love her. I think we all are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she, where I, I was saying like uh, the level that Kelly operates at, you can't do without sacrificing relationships in your life, you know, yep. or whatever. Yep. I feel like, and I know nothing about her personal relationships, but I feel like she's figured out a way to do both things. Uh -huh. I feel like she can operate at a level of winning world titles. Yeah. But then a couple of years, she, a few of them slip by. Yeah. Because she's also maybe entertaining these other things that are appealing to her. No, you know? I think you're right. And I think the other thing that's an interesting one, and it almost, it's not always that common because I think sometimes like athletic ec excellence comes from this like one dimensional kind of my, my, myopic, myopic. The blinders are on, you're only focused on the thing. And hence, I think a lot of athletes can be quite, quite on, like high level athletes can be sort of boring because they don't have a lot of other interests. Exactly. Whereas, and I think this is a result of how gifted she is today, but certainly there was, a, I think when she came on the scene and first started winning back to, you know, multiple world titles, 
she was surfing so far above anyone else that she was allowed to kind of look around a little bit more than, okay. you know, so she was, she's interested in music. She's interested in people. And I think there's, she has like a curiosity for life, interested in travel, going to places off the beaten path. Um, and I think in many ways, it, it, to use the word like an, a surfing odyssey, her odyssey, like, she, you know, coming from northern New South Wales in Australia, becoming a world champion, becoming a, a like very recognizable face in surfing, going to New York City, going to Paris, going to places that are like being interviewed for magazines outside of surfing she's there's like a Kelly has this too. There's like an education that just comes. It just inevitably comes as a result of doing that. You just meet a lot of people and, um, and your world expands and grows larger and you take in a lot and that can be dangerous. I think sometimes yeah. for athletes, but because she's so talented, she's been able to still win the world titles and do all those other things. So right. there's like, for lack of a better description, there's a well-rounded person there. There's not this person that's just a jock, you yeah, know? Yeah. That's what I get out of her too. Yep. Um, Moving on from soundings, what the heck has happened to the Westerly documentary? Oh, the Westerly documentary is coming out real soon. Is it? Yes. Man. I don't have an actual date, but it's coming out very soon. And I, I quote me on this one, but there's, there are details that I can't disclose, unfortunately, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making this up. Okay. It took uh, a long time. The pandemic kind of put some stuff on hold. That thing was on hold before the pandemic. I feel like it was ready to go like in 2018. Well, but here's the thing. So this is a Surface Journal story as well. 2009, I went to Australia with my late wife for a month on vacation. I loved Australia. I lived in Australia. I have so many friends in Australia. She'd never been there. I said, we got to go to Australia. But because I'm an opportunist and a hand-to-mouth sort of guy, Right before I left, I called Scott Hewlett, editor of the journal at that time, and I said, um, Scott, any, I'm going to Australia for a, a month. Any stories that I should pursue? And he said, well, Peter Druin is now living as a woman. If you can get that story, we'd love to have a profile. Um, so I went, and Derek Riley at, at the time, Stab, now Beach Grit, gave me a contact. I called. I wasn't sure whether to ask for Peter or Westerly. It turned out it was definitely Westerly. And I wrote a profile for the Surfers Journal that was very well received. And then I wrote sort of versions of that story for different magazines around the world. And, and it, again, was well received. And I thought, oh, I'm on to something really great. So along with Alan White, who's a director, we embarked upon making this film. But we knew at the time that it was not, it wasn't like the, the story was still happening in real time. It wasn't, it wasn't some retrospective historical thing about like Peter's surfing career. It was Peter's now living as a woman in transition, wanting to get gender, gender reassignment surgery. Um, and then there's the post-surgery life. So it's, I wrote the profile in 2009. I think it was 2012 that Peter went to Bangkok for gender reassignment surgery. There was a big um, event in Australia that was for a historical surfing event where all the peers and contemporaries of Peter's were going to be there. So we went there to film that. But then there was this sort of period after where it was, okay, what's it like living now as a woman with completion? Um, so we were following that. And then there was a major t turn that happened after that. So it was this thing where we kind of knew we were on to like, you know, maybe a decade's worth of following this story. Um, and we did, we sort of closed the story a couple of years ago, but the pandemic, as I say, stalled it. So, it's, you know, we, I think we like wrapped or, or, um, locked picture, um, two years ago or something like that. So but it's coming out real soon. And you wrote a book. Yes. Be Becoming Westerly. Yep. And that book ends with him having the gender reassignment. Yes. Right. Yes. In Bangkok. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But that would have been 2000. When did that book? The book came out in 2014. Okay. Yep. So the movie tells many more stories stuff that happened after after the book. Yep. Got it. Yep. Can you reveal what the current, uh, what's the current status of Westerly? I might be giving away too much. Okay. Yeah. I mean, don't I, reveal I, if you don't, I'd rather not. I, I, I could, I mean, I don't, I don't mean that in some like, you know, secretive way, but there there's, I think that there's like stuff that is not well, um, hasn't been, uh, Westerlies live very publicly and Peter as well, but there are things that are not out there in the media that are available to people. So I would love for them to have the surprise of some of the things that have happened since. Got it. Um, 
I am so excited to see that. Thank you. The trailer that you guys put out years ago just was so enticing. Yeah. So much has happened um, with the trans community and the general public. Yes. In terms of acceptance and mainstream everything. Yep. Did any of that conversation affect the release of the film? De definitely. You know, when we started, when I started, quite honestly, I mean, I'll be totally honest. Growing up in LA, I feel like I was exposed to more than a lot of the surfers that I that that I competed with were my contemporaries. Um, you know, I was there were there was more what what we say that there were there was more uh, diversity in my upbringing, and so when I was on tour through the late eighties into the early nineties, I I didn't not I don't mean this in an arrogant way, but I thought to myself a lot of the surfers that are these great surfers their their scope is fairly limited. They've come from smaller towns, whatever. I grew up in Los Angeles. I I was exposed to a lot, um, and so when I started writing about surfing and, and doing surf journalism, I definitely felt like there's a homogenization of the culture. I'm writing these are all the same stories. Everyone's sort of praying to the same god, and they're kind of giving me the same narrative. And, and I, I, there was a part of me that was kind of at odds. Like I, I, I hated hearing narrow-minded talk among surfers. And I was, I, there was a time when I was like, I'm a surfer through and through, but I'm not sure I even really like surfers that much or I'm not sure that this is my, these are my people. When I heard that Peter Drone was living as Westerly Windina, I thought, this is a story I'm going to get behind with like sight unseen. Like with, before I even had met Westerly, I'm behind this just because I like the idea that it's challenging this sort of status quo or this homogenization of this surf culture. Um, and as I interviewed people around Westerly, I got what most of the responses were the responses I expected, which is like, you know, not, not uh, understanding, not very compassionate. Um, it, it was they, being feeling like uncomfortable and threatened. And I was, there was a part of me that was like, great, 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 I'm supporting this thing. And and I had this epiphany that I'm almost ashamed to say, but I remember realizing how marginalized trans people are because in LA, in a particular stretch of Santa Monica Boulevard, I would often see transgender women, men, wearing dresses and high heels, pushing a shopping cart with their belongings, i.e. they were homeless. And at that time, I thought, wow, the trans people have it so rough in this world. They can't even, you know, they can't get a job, right? And, uh, you know, in some instances, it could have been drugs or mental health issues or whatever. But um, but I, it, was, it was like, there was almost this like fixed image in my brain of like seeing a transgender woman, man dressed as a woman, homeless. Um, and then Caitlyn Jenner came out and we started becoming more aware, transparent. The TV show came out. Um, and I think it's, I think it's so great that we've become much more, it, there's a, there's a dialogue, there's a conversation, there's a, um, awareness and an education around trans people and an acceptance and an embracing, which I think is absolutely terrific. But what, what started as a, like naive surfers telling a story that they don't really know suddenly became this thing of like cultural appropriation. And do you, what, what makes you think you get to tell that story? And so as we, 10 years later in the story, the, that was the questions we had to ask ourselves. And we had to actually be very conscious of like not making faux pas of cis, as the, 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 the classic cisgender male faux pas, like straight white dudes trying to present this person, um, not really understanding their, their story and where they come from. The part that got weird was there's an underlying question throughout the book and probably the documentary as well, as to whether or not Peter is trying to dupe everyone. Yes, for sure. Because for anybody who doesn't know Peter's background, uh, he was a showman. Yes. And he was kind of a sh shyster, yeah. you know, yeah. often, often yep. kind of creating these kind of smoke and mirror magic shows to present something as bigger than, they, than it is. For sure. Then the spotlight went away from him. Yes, so when he comes back presenting as Westerly, yep. you're right. Part of it is a narrow-minded pro-surf community who doesn't understand. Yeah. But they had va they had reasons to be critical. And that was who Peter, they always knew Peter to be. For sure. And so that underlying question of what if Westerly is a charade? Yeah. 
and we get duped into making this documentary using her kind of as the spokesperson for this community. Yep. And it turns out that she was pulling a gag all along. Yeah. Then eggs on your face. Yeah. No, that was all. Those were questions throughout. And, uh, and, and Peter had gone to NIDA, which is the National Institute of Dramatic Arts in Australia, which is a great, right. great, right. like a really good actor. Forgot and, about that. Yeah. And Peter had a career as an actor. Um, so there was a very theatrical side to Peter Druin. In fact, Shane Haran, uh, the surfer, told me a great story of um, being at like some kind of awards presentation. And I think Peter was called up. Maybe I don't know if Peter won the contest or whatever, but was like called up to get an award. And everyone's sitting in like you know fold, folding chairs with the stage and the podium. And as he's walking up, he he puts his hand on his heart and he very slowly does this incredibly dramatic heart attack. And as he comes down, he like he's leaning on chairs to hold himself up, and he falls down, and the chairs all fall down, and everyone is like, "Oh my God, Peter is having a heart attack." And I'm not sure whether this is an exaggeration, but Shane said that there were actually like paramedics that rushed in. And only when the paramedics were there, Peter jumped up and took a bow. And it was like, it was all, it was all a joke. It was all a gag. It was all theater. Right. So I think there were a lot of those things that Peter had done that made the folks that had grown up alongside Peter go, okay, we're all old dudes now. No one pays attention to us. Peter's suddenly living as a woman. This is just a ploy for attention. And Peter was very public in doing so. So there was that thing of like, you know, is the yeah, is this a conscious thing? And is and 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 is is Westerly like a, a a contrived persona, or is this a genuine gender dysphoria thing of um I feel I, I'm a, I feel I'm live I'm born in the wrong gender and I'm a woman, and that tension was there throughout. Um, and there was a, there's a really great quote in the documentary where someone says. Um, and this is sort of later on. I think um, part it was part of it was acting taking over real life, and part of it was real life taking over acting. And um, yeah, and I and and we you know we've the film lets the viewer decide that Good. themselves. So we there's not like there's not some commentary from us going this is exactly what it is because we don't know, and maybe Peter slash Westerly doesn't know as well. And that goes for all of us. Like how we don't always know our motivations. We don't always know what's driving us. And to be honest, both are equally interesting. Yeah. You know what I, like yeah. re, I, I was worried that the film would get canceled before release. Yeah. Because maybe he was faking or yep. she was faking. Yep. And in the end, I'm like, that's a more compelling film in a lot of ways. Yeah, for sure. Cause you got gender reassignment surgery. Yep. So yeah. that's a commitment to the role. Yeah. The psychology of somebody who would walk through those paces is worth discussing, yeah. viewing, analyzing, having com conversation about. Yeah, so for sure. I'm excited. Yeah, well, thanks. Super excited to see that final kind Thank of chapter. You. Thanks. Yeah. Um, we, you referenced a couple of times that you're 55 years old. Mm hmm I want to talk a little bit about fitness. Mm -hmm. uh, how often are you surfing nowadays? I kind of go in and out. Like there will be days where I'll surf four or five days in a row and then I won't surf for a week. Um, but a week is the most you take off? Oh, yeah. Good for you. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I live in Malibu and I live close to the ocean and and it's and I have time to do it. Um, I have my, my I write full time, so I have make my schedule as I want it. Um, there was a time I lived in New York for about 11 years and that I was, it wasn't available to me to go surfing. So in, in some ways I learned from that, that, okay, if I'm like driving by the ocean every day and I see waves, I should get, I should go out and get a couple. Yeah. Good for you. Yep. Um, what do you do in addition? Do you do any cross training, so to speak? I have a road bike and I ride up steep hills with not a lot of cars around. And then I have this, um, it's kind of an odd like push-ups and then yoga warrior pose thing that I do that if you were watching from the side, it would look like a little bit like maybe some Tai Chi and then a little bit of just like traditional like burpees type things or, or push-ups. Wow. And I, it's, it's like a thing that I've sort of been doing recently that um, it's not, I didn't learn it anywhere, but it just kind of feels right. But it's, it's a quick thing, but I do it every day. 
and I'm, I'm pretty good about it. So it's kind of a calisthenic slash stretching thing. Yes, and I get the cardio up by riding up the steep hills, and I ride them pretty hard. And how many miles a week are you riding? I don't even know. Okay. And the number would probably be minimal because I'm mainly going up steep hills. Right. What got you into road bikes? Uh, always into them. When I So I grew up in Westlake Village, which is the west, far west end of the San Fernando Valley. And I didn't... Bef- when I, I started competing when I was 14... Kind of age 15, I knew I wanted to be a pro surfer. And that was like, at that time, there was, these were like the early period of um, pro surfers treating themselves as athletes, taking themselves more seriously. So I was seeing that, you know, Tom Kern was a couple years older and I looked up to him and he was very seriously pursuing like athletic ex- excellence. And so the, so I bought a road bike, a Peugeot road bike um, from a friend secondhand, $150, which was a big expense at this time. This would have been like 84. And um, when I couldn't get to the beach, I would ride as hard as I could around the neighborhood with a mustard yellow Walkman on my ears, listening to whatever music to rev me up. And I lived in this, this suburbia that I really wanted to get out of. It was this, I was listening to a lot of punk rock at the time. And so it was kind of like I was just trying to pedal my way out of that place. But the pedaling was to get the fitness to win the NSSA or WSA contest on the weekend that was going to get me the first places that would make my sponsor, would, would help me to pursue uh, or convince my sponsors to send me out on the road. Yeah. So in a weird way, it's like I, uh, the cycling has always been a source of fitness. And I'm not schooled. I don't read them. I don't read up on bikes. I don't really know bikes but I totally love cycling and I do it pretty much every day. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Yep. Um, what's your diet like, or do you manage your diet at all? Kind of all over the place, to be honest. Okay. I mean, I, there was a time when I was, when I was a pro surfer, I was, I didn't eat red meat. And at the time that was like the carbo loading era. There was a book called eat to win by Robert Haas, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading it and I remember making notes and I was really conscious of all these things. And then when I started writing, um, I realized that I'd been living with the blinders on in many ways. And I almost had like a LSD experience without doing the LSD where I just thought, oh my God, the world is so fascinating and interesting. And I finally get to pursue it because I've been living in the bubble of competitive surfing and a- athleticism. Um, and now that I'm a writer, the more I can experience, the better. And the writers I was reading were all about that. A lot of the beat writers, etc. So I thought I'm going to eat, I'm, I'm going to kind of apply the when in Rome approach to everything I do. And I, I was lucky because I was writing for different magazines and I was traveling a lot. So when I went to, um, you know, France to write a piece for surfing magazine, I would eat all the French food. When I went to Amsterdam for the cannabis cup to write a story for bikini magazine, I smoked all the weed. It was sort of like what I, the, the idea was just to like embrace whatever was around you. And my diet for better or for worse is, uh, pretty much on that path still. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything you avoid? Do you avoid sugar, dairy, alcohol? Uh, tr- less sugar. I try to avoid sugar, although sometimes I like it. And then I go in and out with alcohol. Like there are times when um, I'll go a few months without drinking at all. I really don't drink anything other than red wine, but I like red wine. Um, but I have, uh, I try to keep it in moderation. But no, there's, I kind of, I'm like uh, omnivorous in many ways. Yeah. Sounds like a healthy relationship with food and yourself. I hope so. Um, At one one point I was in a low and I thought I was drinking too much and I was really like questioning that. And I was talking to my friend, Charles Smith, who's sober and he's been, he'd been sober for quite some time. And I, and I said, you know, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if I'm an addict and I'm wondering if I should get sober. And he said, no, whatever you do, don't get sober. You'll just become another kind of annoying that no one will, will want to be around. <laughs> right now you're in, you're annoying, but people are okay being around you. Um, no, I mean, I, I always ask people, or not always, but I often ask people about um, diet and fitness and all that sort of stuff. No, it's and a good some people are Well, some people are so regimented, you know, and it's yeah. like, they're just not enjoying anything and it's, they're trying to hold on to this youth that is yeah. elu- that they're never going to actually re- attain. But other people, I, I feel like um, you, the more that you try to not, if you told yourself I can never eat donuts. Yeah. Every time you drive past a donut shop, 
you're going to be craving that donut I, so badly. I know what you mean. If you once a week are like, Sundays, I'm going to have a donut if I want it. Yep. There'll be Sundays where you don't want it. Yeah. You know? Yep. No, I know. It's interesting. I think we're in such the life hacking mode right now that it's, and there's, there's so much education. We know so much more than we ever did. But I also think there's, um, I don't know, there's a level, there's also a level of just like self-acceptance. I feel like I'm working more on self-acceptance is more, at the, there was a time in my life where like self-excellence was what I was aspiring to. Yeah. Now I'm more into self-acceptance. Cool. And I just feel like the more, and I want to be healthy, of course. Like I don't mean, yeah. I'm not using that as rationalization to like eat 12 donuts, but I think there's a level of not, of just like, being in the world and embracing embracing everything um, and not beating yourself up. I, if anything, I probably am too hard on myself. So mm. my job now is like do it all and turn off your conscience and don't beat the shit out of yourself over it. Um, that's almost more the work to do as opposed to make your diet this like right. perfect thing that's going to make you – that. that there's, and, and I'm of a certain age where I see sometimes that around me and it's like – it can also be a weirdly like midlife crisis type thing where you're wearing too tight of t-shirts and you're flaunting all the little things of, of, of yesterday or of youth that are being hung on to. And I, I don't know, there's just like a, there's a level of grace that I aspire to in my life. And it's, and it, and much of it is a sort of self-acceptance or just being like tapping into your own essence and being that a hundred percent and doing and, and finding that place, not based on, pressure, the advertising, the capitalist system that is telling you that these are the things that matter, these are the values, this is what's important, a six pack as we were talking about earlier, whatever that thing is, like just being fully who you are as much as you can and that, and letting that be the, uh, the, the compass. Good. The, the fact that you also integrate discipline of riding the bike is the reason why it works. Yeah. If you were exclusively self-accepting, but then, then had no discipline of any type of exercise, yep. it could easily go in a bad direction. Yeah. You know? No, for sure. But, but you discipline's know, good. I think so too. But there is like, there's a level and I, and this is like a podcast theme as well that I've been curious about. Ex-athletes, it's kind of like, you're kind of cursed for the rest of your life because you know, a high level of functioning physically not only in an egotistical way of like, okay, I can go out and surf and I'm tearing the shit out of it and everyone's, everyone's like complimenting me. There's like that side of it. But then there's also this thing of like, I'm breathing in and I feel so damn good right now. And I think for pro athletes, you, you typically, you tap that, you, you like, that bar is set very, very high. And for the rest of your life, you're sort of cursed because if you slack too far from that, you're like, God, I know, I, I know a way of feeling so much better than I do. And if I don't, you know, I rarely go like more than two days without doing something physically okay. like strenuous because I, I'm, I'm immediately just feeling like slack and yeah, lazy. Lethargic. And There's, I remember hearing somebody talking about bodybuilding. It was like a bodybuilding documentary and they were saying it's, the only thing in the, well, maybe not the only, but it's one of the things in the world where you can devote a ton amount of time to this thing, you know, just like these muscles are just getting huge. And as soon as you stop doing it, there's no benefit of it at all. Uh -huh. Like yeah. it, it actually turns to fat. Yeah. So unless you keep pumping that iron, yeah. the muscle doesn't look like that. And there's, it's not like you read a book when you read a book, there's long-term benefit. You now have knowledge. You're yeah. now informed, you know, yep. all that kind of thing. The weightlifting is just all this time spent for the immediacy of it. For sure. Without any long-term benefit of it. And it ends up becoming, you. if you're that bulked up, it just becomes fat. No, it's so true. And it's the scary. other, no, I, I totally am with you. And I've thought about this a lot. And the other side of the curse of, of a ex-pro athlete, let's say, is that, you place such a high premium on physicality. And so your identity is based on like, I got to be like fit and trim and whatever. And I often think, um, I, I, I remember once talking to a, an ex athlete peer and he was telling me how like he was training with Navy SEALs and all this sort of stuff. And I remember walking away going, is that what we should be doing? Or is it maybe like while we spent all those years on the beach surfing, Maybe we use this latter part of life to study and 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 exercise our brains and and um, engage there in ways that we didn't back then. And I sort of I feel like that's naturally integrated into my life as a writer because I am I read a lot and I'm curious in that way. But I definitely feel what you're saying, which is like 
I'm more interested in sitting and reading for three hours a day than I am like working out for three hours a day. Totally. Totally. Uh, are you writing a memoir? <laughs> I've been writing a memoir for a long, long time. I know we talked about it last time. Yeah. I, um, I've had like various iterations of a memoir about my surfing life. Um, and then I've like published excerpts and cleaned up things. I've yet to pull it off quite honestly. Like I've yet, I've yet to kind of get it right. Um, but I'm still, I'm like working on it and not working on it. I'm not actively working on it right now, but it's been something that I've been doing forever. It's been a, tr a tricky thing. It's been hard. I mean, it, again, it's made me like apply um, a different way of thinking about it because at one point I thought, oh, it's a failed, like my failed memoir. And I thought, actually, that's like way too black and white because there's a process in all of this that you just have to sort of surrender to. Um, and a lot of writing, I mean, I think a lot of like artistic pursuits can work that way. There's there's a like gestation period. You kind of have to give it time, much like what I was saying with the film about Westerly. It's like, had we, had we tried to close it up at one point, we would have missed a lot of really interesting things that would happen later on. Yeah. I agree. There's still chapters to be written in that, but certainly when um, ideas and concepts come, get them down. Yeah. Yep. Put them to paper now, organize it all later. Yeah. Yep. Um, are you going to live in LA your whole life? What the heck are you doing there? Yeah. I wonder that sometimes. Um, I'm trying to figure that one out. I, I like, like, I like urban culture. I like the, or I should say, I like, I like the diversity of people. Um, I have great friends there. I like that it's a place where people go to pursue their dreams. So there are people striving in it with the striving is excellence comes excellence and comes interesting people. Um, so I think I couldn't like, a I don't think I could like move to suburbia and sort of sign off and feel stimulated. Um, but there, are, there, are, there. Are, so there, so there's that thing in ter in terms of like the people that I'm surrounded by and the people I hang out with. But I definitely connect sometimes with more small town places. Um, I've spent time in like Northern California and in, in quiet places that feel really good. So I don't quite know. Okay. Yeah. But you're content there for the time being. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time. I know. Yeah. Yeah. But good for you if you are. I mean, I just feel. Um, the pace of it is where I would check out at a certain point. You know, yeah. like it's just, yeah, I'm stimulated by all the things you're talking about, but at some point I want less stimulation. For sure. So No, I, and I'm kind of open to all of it at this point. Um, but at the same time, I think I've, I've like found a, my, I've found my own values within LA. I think there, there's definitely, there can be a kind of keeping up with the Joneses thing that can happen in a For place sure. like that. I felt it when I lived in New York too. It's like, everyone's doing all this stuff. I gotta be doing stuff. Um, and now I'm very, like, I, I feel like my, uh, my day is designed based on a lot of work with my, within myself to, to go, this is what's important. Um, so I don't, you know, I live, I live among millionaires and I'm definitely not a millionaire. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, Oh, I like LA. You're in a beautiful part of it too. Yeah, I am. That's the other thing. I am. You're in the, a little enclave. Yes. The surf isn't great, but at, I'm at a point where I don't think like where I live next will be dictated by the surf. Good. Yeah. Good. That's healthy as well. Yep. Uh, final question is just what are you currently writing? What is the last surfboard you've been writing? I'm writing a 610 CI mid. Wow. The mid. Look at you. Yes. The Devin Howard model. Yeah, it's actually a Devin. It's very much Devin. Devin's a friend of mine, and Devin helped me um, get this board uh, right. Good. Yep. What do you think of it? I love it. Do you? Yeah. Good. I mean, it suits me perfectly, and I, I went through a period where I was probably in my late 40s, and I was riding, like, whatever the newest short board design was, and I was noticing that the board wanted to do things quicker than my body would. Yep. So the board was ahead of me. And I feel like with the, the mid, the 610 mid, my body is maybe slightly ahead of the board in terms wow. of like performance stuff. And I say that mod, I say that humbly. Okay. But what I mean is like, it's a bigger board to swing around, yeah. but it's not a board that like wants to be doing spinners and I'm trying to keep up with it. It's not, it's like, it's to, it's, I'm not riding dry. Like the, the, the short board was the formula one car. Now I'm riding something more like a Cadillac or driving something more like a Cadillac or what have you. Um, 
And, uh, and I have a twin pin on order, which I'm really excited about. You talked about wanting to age gracefully. Those boards will help you do it. Yeah. That's the appropriate board to be riding. Yeah. The yep. mid. And the, the Tom Curran, the free scrubber with him riding the twin pin. Yes. Early versions of it was yep. so aspirational. I was like, dude. I know that thing was. One of those things. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. But I still love surfing so much. And I, and I really love a lot of really just subtle little things. I mean, I, the, it's weird weird because when I was growing up, this thing of the, like the, the trim line was not even really a thing. I mean, you surfed around the twin, the trim line, but now I have this thing where I'll like put my board as high as I possibly can and just go straight across it. And sometimes in a low crouch and just feel that and let like the thing crash all over me, not even in the tube. Yeah. 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 Um, but those, those like, I feel like in many ways I'm going for like feelings. I'm trying to get like just a feeling in my body from the, the wave. Sometimes I, I play a little bit with, I have an 88 that I ride with like semi finless. It has like nubs on it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so there will be a little bit of a drift and side slip, but I, the, it's kind of like going surfing, getting those little sensations, and then carrying those sensations on to your terrestrial life, if you will. Totally. <laughs> yeah. It's what we've all been trying to do since our youth. Yep. Totally. Yep. Well, Jamie, this has been a wonderful conversation as yeah. always, man. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you David. Thrilled to. A real yeah. joy. Thank you. Thanks for driving down. Yep. All right.